happy that we are continuing to hold the UST USP joint symposium. Now, this is just one of the activities that form the very unique partnership between the University of Santo Tomas and the University of Shiga Prefecture. And on a personal note, I must say that um, this partnership is almost as old as my um, research career after I finished my PhD. So you will know uh, in a few seconds why um, the USP-USP partnership is very close to my heart as well as that of my research group. So it all began um, in 2012 when I met uh, Professor Urabe and uh, Professor Ban in the University of Shiga Prefecture when we were trying to discuss um, future collaborative partnerships between our research groups. Now, eventually this led to um, Professor Urabe's 2013 visit to the University of Santo Tomas, where she offered in our USD graduate school a certificate course in fish parasitology that was well attended by graduate students, as well as professionals affiliated with other um, national government agencies and other private and public higher educational institutions throughout the Philippines. So this was the first time that uh, Professor Urabe um, got the chance to visit um, UST and it already led to a very fruitful um, partnership. Now, this is one of the scenes that happened um, during the said workshop, wherein you would have the laboratory session, the laboratory course um, in um, the laboratories of the USD Graduate School. Um, I'd like to um, highlight the person who I encircled here. Um, he's here with us in the audience. Later on, you will find out how um, he, well, during this time, he was um, uh, a freshman Masteral student in our biology program, um, how he would later on figure out in the partnership between USP and USP. Then this was followed in 2015 with the first USP USP um, joint symposium, which was again held in the University of Santo Tomas. Um, the theme of that conference was current trends in aquatic biology, and it saw presentations from um, uh, professors from the University of Shiga Prefecture, as well as uh, professors from the uh, University of Santo Tomas, and has also led to um, uh, a very dynamic interaction between our graduate and undergraduate students, as well as the um, professors and the graduate students who visited the Philippines coming from the University of Shiga Prefecture. Um, 2015, um, I again had the chance to visit um, Hikone um, to talk with Professor Ban and Professor Urabe about um, future research plans that we have. And uh, later on, I'll show you where these meetings with um, our USP counterparts have produced over the years. So in 2017, we held the second USD-USP uh, joint symposium. And this um, coincided with um, the Science Week, uh, the USD College of Science Week for 2017. Um, for this year, for example, um, our fourth USD-USP joint symposium um, is happening just a few days before we will be holding our um, annual Science Week celebrations in the college. And right after that um, second USD USP joint symposium, um, we have uh, offered to students of the University of Shiga Prefecture a summer course in biodiversity and urban environments in the tropics, wherein students of the University of Shiga Prefecture had the opportunity to visit some um, important um, sites in the Philippines, including Mount Pakiling. Uh, Lake Taal, as well as uh, visit some uh, partner communities of the University of Santo Tomas in um, Metro Manila. And in 2017, around December, we held the third USD-USP joint symposium 
wherein um, faculty members, um, students, um, both graduate and undergraduate, had the chance to visit um, Hikone and um, present posters and um, present their research uh, papers um, to our colleagues in Japan. So this was a very memorable experience because um, it, it wasn't just the faculty members who got to visit together with graduate students. We were also able to bring our undergraduate students from the BS Biology program who were able to discuss their research interests with our partners from the University of Shiga Prefecture. Now, this is uh, the reason why we have been holding so many meetings. And I think apart from the joint symposia, I would like to share that this partnership has led to the successful completion of the doctoral dissertations of two of um, our students in the University of Santo Tomas. So they are now playing very important roles in this symposium and are also conducting um, independent researches by themselves that are also continuing to be in collaboration with the University of Shiga Prefecture. So I'm talking about Dr. Jonathan Carlo Briones, who was a visiting um, research student in USP um, for his uh, dissertation on uh, fish parasites. And Dr. Dino Tordesillas of the USD Senior High School has also, con uh, has also been um, a, a visiting research student in the University of Shiga Prefecture. And he worked on um, the development of um, the invasive copepod Arctodiaptomus dorsalis um, with the laboratory of uh, Professor Shuhei Ban. And um, it is not just this, these two initial students that um, have benefited from the close partnership between uh, UST and USP because now um, Dr. Briones has um, two former master's and undergraduate thesis advisees are pursuing their PhDs in USP. So we have um, Arvin Markaida and Janelle Gakad. So it is not just in terms of holding the joint symposia that we are having this partnership. We are also leading to the development and improvement of our research capabilities in the University of Santo Tomas and also providing opportunities um, for our students to learn um, more by their exposure to the University of Shiga Prefecture. And more importantly, this has led to novel knowledge that has been published in quality peer-reviewed international journals. And I am pretty sure um, that the partnership will continue to benefit both UST and USP um, by producing more students, you know? um, either USP students continuing to um, take courses in the Philippines or maybe even take their degrees here, um, UST students going into USP and finishing their degrees there, and in the process, come up with novel knowledge that come out in the form of publications and other research outputs. So um, I hope that this trip down memory lane um, will um, um, remind everyone of the very special partnership between UST and USP that I am happy um, is continuing to move on progress and further develop. And um, no pandemic or no virus can stop this partnership. And this is um, proven by what we are seeing now. Us moving this into an online format is a way for us to adapt. And um, I'm very thankful to our partners from the University of Shiga Prefecture. I'm very thankful for um, the unique work that has been put in by our um, organizers um, spearheaded by um, doctors uh, Jonathan Carlo Briones and Dr. Tordesillas um, together with Mr. Gerald Sullivan and um, Dr. Nikki Dagama, our um, uh, representative to the Internationalization Committee for the Biology Department. So for all our participants, um, may we all have a very successful and fruitful um, two-day symposium. 
and uh, just like the sentiments of our um, colleagues from the University of Shiga Prefecture, um, we do hope to see each other in a non-virtual format uh, after this pandemic is over. So we will continue to further enrich the partnership that UST and USP already have established. Um, thank you very much. Uh, maraming salamat sa inyo lahat. Thank you very much, Dean Ray Don Papa, the Dean of the College of Science of the University of Santo Tomas. For now, before we continue with the invited lectures, let us first have a quick look at our platform. We would like to remind everyone that all of the documentation, the book of abstracts, the posters are available here in our course site. If you remember, if you have um, registered in the Fort USD USP Symposium and course site, you will have access to these various materials. For example, our Zoom room, which you will find here once you click on this web link. We also have our book of abstracts, wherein if you click on it, it will lead you to a separate uh, web page, which contains a PDF file of the actual book of abstracts, which is also downloadable. And so we encourage everyone to get a copy of this book of abstracts. In the book of abstracts, you will find the schedule of events together with a few photos of Hikunyan and Saiger working together. You will see the details for day one and day two. Please take note of your poster number or the poster numbers of specific abstracts that you would like to read. Once you go in the other details of the book of abstracts, you will see an overall list like this one. And then the individual abstracts with their titles and numbers found at the top. So please uh, take this opportunity to get the book of abstracts. Other than this, may we remind everyone that if you have a specific schedule that you would like to see, our schedule is available here. There is a schedule in particular for the Philippine time, for the Japan time, and Vietnam and Indonesia time, specifically in Jakarta. And then lastly, we invite everyone to please go to the poster hall. Don't be shy. Ask questions by clicking on reply. Here, you will see various discussion boards wherein each major category for the posters, as you see them in the schedule, have been made. So please go into the poster hall. If you have any questions, uh, click on the reply icon. And we have asked all of the authors to respond to you in, in kind. Thank you very much. Okay, to start of our invited lectures, our first invited lecture is a special research, special researcher who is helping the Philippines and everyone abroad with regards to the COVID-19 pandemic. He has an education in biology, 
PhD from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, as well as a doctorate in sacred theology in moral theology from the University of Freiburg. So if you heard that correctly, that's true. He is both a researcher and a priest. His specific areas of expertise would be biology of cancer, aging, program cell death, healthcare ethics and bioethics in the Catholic tradition, philosophical and theological implications of modern evolutionary theory. He is currently a professor in Providence College, Rhode Island, and also a visiting professor in the University of Santo Tomas. With this, let us all welcome the talk of Reverend Father Nicanor Ostriaco. His talk will focus on the USD COVAX combating COVID-19 vaccine hesitancy in the Philippines with a science-based public awareness information campaign. This is also a very special talk because this work he will be co-presenting with our undergraduate College of Science students, namely Dean Lotus Alano and April Ann Uy. With this, let us welcome our presenters. So um, good morning from the United States. I'm just wondering, will will this uh, will our previously recorded lecture? Okay, good. <laughs> good morning. My name is Father Nicanor Ostriaco, and I am the principal investigator for the USD Covax team. I would like to begin by thanking the organizers of the fourth USD USP symposium for inviting me and my research students to present a platform presentation this morning on our current ongoing work uh, using a science-based public awareness information campaign to com combat COVID-19 vaccine hesitancy in the Philippines. Our presentation this morning is going to be divided into three sections. I will briefly introduce our work, and then I am proud to uh, hand off the rest of my lecture to two of my research students who are in, uh, enrolled in, the third, in their third year of the Industrial Biology Program in the School of Science at the University of Santo Tomas. So we'll begin with an introduction and then we'll present our data on vaccine hesitancy in the Philippines. We will conclude with a summary of our uh, ongoing work to respond to this vaccine hesitancy using um, a social media platform. So to begin, uh, our project was triggered by the publication of the Pulse Asia survey in early January that revealed that nearly half of the Pinoys who had been surveyed were preparing to skip out on the COVID-19 vaccine. And uh, what was particularly striking is that none of the COVID-19 vaccines had been approved yet for use in the Philippines. So in order to try to, uh, to understand the roots of this vaccine hesitancy, we had, we had two questions in mind. Why exactly are Filipinos vaccine hesitant? Some had suggested that this was related to, to the dengue vaccine scandal uh, several years ago. We wanted to try, we wanted to interrogate this question uh, using scientific means. We also wanted to, uh, begin to initiate a public awareness campaign in order to increase vaccine confidence. And so we established the beginning of the second semester of this academic year, the USD COVAX awareness team. And this is one of our first and only group pictures taken on Zoom. We are a team of 24 uh, individuals, most of whom are three I bio students at USD. We also have three students in the third year from the Department of Advertising Arts. 
from the College of Fine Arts and Design. So I would like to hand off uh, this lecture to my research student, April Ui, who will now begin a discussion on vaccine hesitancy in the Philippines. Go for it, April. So we are now presenting the results of the online national open access survey deployed from January 16 to 30, 2021 on several social media platforms. Next slide, please. We garnered 15,651 completed responses from all the 17 regions of the Philippines, 44% of which comes from the national capital region. We asked the question, if a vaccine for COVID-19 is available in the Philippines, would you use it? 56% said that they would definitely or probably take the vaccine, while 44% are still unsure or are not willing to get vaccinated. Although majority are willing to get vaccinated, we still have to convince a large number of Filipinos to get vaccinated for the country to achieve third immunity. Next slide, please. In line with the increasing number of available vaccine brands from different countries, we asked the respondents their preference in vaccines. There was greatest preference for those vaccines made in USA and the Europe with 46%, while the Russian and Chinese vaccines were very little, were very uh, less preferred. Uh, however, a majority of 51% said that they would take any vaccine as long as it is safe and effective. This low preference in certain vaccine brands is concerning because we need Russian and Chinese vaccines to vaccinate the 70 million people that we need to achieve third immunity. Next slide, please. We found that these hesitancies come from several significant worries, including getting inoculated with fake vaccines, vaccine side effects, vaccine safety, and vaccine efficacy. This concerns may be addressed through a public awareness campaign that would inform and enlighten the general public about the safety and efficacy of these vaccines. The government should also ensure the Filipinos that they would have tight security and safety measures that would warrant the authenticity of COVID-19 vaccines that the public will receive. Next slide, please. A large majority of the respondents said that they would only get vaccinated after many people received the vaccine and after politicians received the vaccine. At this time of great fear and apprehension, what the public needs is reassurance. Our team therefore urged all political leaders from the national government and LGUs, more especially the president, to get vaccinated in public to give the Filipino people confidence that the COVID-19 vaccines are indeed safe. Following the release of the survey, it was announced that President Duterte agreed to get vaccinated in public, and we hope to convince more. My teammates, Dominic Tuyugan, Tain Fermo, and Rafael Mosquito are also doing a presentation that will go at this with more detail. Please do visit Poster 13 to see the rest of the results. Next slide. Finally, we deployed another vaccine hesitancy, particularly for Filipino healthcare workers. A total of 1,116 respondents of different healthcare professions are presented in this preliminary data, 87% of which said that they would definitely or probably take the vaccine, which is higher than the 56% that we found from the national survey. This survey will be deployed for another week before releasing the final Thank you very much, April Louis. I now hand it off to Dean Alano, who will, who will complete our lecture by describing the response of the USD COVAX team. In response to what Father Nick in April on shared with us, the USD COVAX awareness team have developed a science-based public awareness information campaign in order to address the vaccine hesitancy in the Philippines. This approach is dubbed as ICE, or impart, communicate, in, communicate and educate, and divided into groups, research, graphics, and social media, which aims to deliver the response of USD COVAX to the people 
and convince them that the vaccines are safe and it is the key to get this pandemic behind us. Next slide, please. As scientists in training, you were given the opportunity to know and to know and understand the complexity of our fields. However, as students, we understand that it should not stop there. You were given the opportunity and the chance to learn because we have a responsibility to share and impart this learning. The research committee composed of industrial biology students works on information about the COVID-19 and the vaccines. As an example, the information in the sample publication in our slide are the product of extensive research and information gathering. In addition to this, the work of research also involves ensuring that the public can figure out complicated concepts using easy to understand words and figures. Next slide, please. A very important aspect of our response is communication. That's why it's the second part is communicate. We have thought that the best way to combat vaccine hesitancy is to consider the culture of Filipinos and what is closest to our hearts. And obviously, that's family. The Philippines is well known to have a close family ties between relatives. We even consider our friends as families. At the same time, we have seek the help of aunts to help us convince the people. Here in the Philippines, we, have, we compare vaccination to the bite of an ant. That is why our strategy to communicate the truth about vaccines aims to appeal to this innate relationship in families that the vaccines will not just save us, it will also save our families. And that is what Graphics Committee is working with, with industrial biology and advertising art students with the team. They allow the ideas and branding of the campaign to come into life. And at the same time, campaigning that getting vaccinated is just like what our parents have told us when we were a child, parang kagat lang na lang yan. It's just a bite of an on. Next slide, please. As we communicate, we also educate the public. As you all know, the primary source of information and unfortunately, even misinformation is social media. That is why we have focused our reach online in order to spread the correct information and debunk misinformation, especially about the vaccines. We have made our presence known on various social media platforms and released discussion questions in order for the public to spark interest about the vaccines, including the policies set forth to combat this pandemic. In addition to that, just this week, we have started COVAX-19 testimonies. It aims to get as much selfies and statements from all Filipinos all over the world about their vaccination experience. We hope that this approach would help convince the Filipino people to be more to, to get vaccinated. And in the coming weeks, we will also be releasing some from Filipinos here in the country who have been vaccinated in time for the rollout of the vaccination program against COVID-19. Next slide, please. Finally, we are also working to partner with institutions in order to help us spread the vaccine awareness. As you all know, the Philippines is composed of three major islands in 17 regions. We aim to create linkages across Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao in order to coordinate our efforts and spread the truth about vaccine and its safety and it, the, the, the truth that it will save us. All of these are being done with one goal of getting this pandemic behind us. So thank you very much to April and to Dean for uh, their wonderful presentations. And thank you again for, to the organizers for inviting us to, to present this USD USB symposium. We will be available for questions during the live portion uh, later this week. Thank you very much. God bless you. Thank you very much, Father Nicanor, Dean, and April. Now, before we continue on, uh, just as we saw in the presentation of Father Nicanor, when he presented the photos of his students in the industrial biology course, uh, before we continue to the next phase, we would like to first ask everyone, take this opportunity to please turn on your cameras so that we will record your presence here today. So we'd like to ask everyone, please uh, turn on your cameras. Okay. 
we're very happy to see so many representatives from all over the world, from Vietnam, from Indonesia, from Bangladesh, Japan, and the Philippines. Now, um, we'll use this time of the symposium to take a photo of our uh, participants. So please give us your best good morning smile. Um, since we are a lot, we'll have to do it in two, uh, two attempts, two panels, because uh, uh, it won't fit in Zoom. Okay, so for the first panel, uh, I can do it in one. I've set mine to 49 participants. In oh, thank, thank you very much, Dino. So will it be okay for you to take yeah. the photo? Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll be the one uh, taking the photo. Okay. okay, thank you very much. So everyone, good morning. And uh, let's take this photo. Uh, give us your biggest smile in three, two, one. Okay, and uh, just uh, uh, wait for a few seconds and just saving the file. And let's have another one. Three, two, one, smile. And that's it. Okay, thank you very much, Dino. Uh, there will be certain times of the meeting that we will ask to do these maybe during the start and the end of each session, okay? So if you check our schedule for our invited lectures, we will first have similar lectures uh, played out. For this first set of lectures, it will be about COVID-19. The lecture of Father Nicanor Ostriaco will now be complemented by the research of one of our uh, colleagues from the Department of Chemistry of the College of Science. Our colleague has an expertise in natural product driven drug discovery. And he has discovered a lot of new and biological agents during his time. He took his bachelor's degree of science in chemistry in the University of Santo Tomas back in 1999. He finished his Master's of Science in Chemistry also in the university with Latin honors magna cum laude back in 2003. And then he finished his Doctor of Natural Sciences in the, in the University of Regensburg in Germany back in 2011 with Latin honors magna cum laude. His research interests focuses on the isolation and total synthesis of complex natural products and medicinal chemistry and computer assisted drug discovery. His research work uh, is very interdisciplinary working with many of us from the department of biology. With this, let us all welcome the talk of Professor Alan Patrick Macabeo, PhD, on their work on the promiscuous binding of mixobacterial depsipeptide chondramides on the receptor binding domains of SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, which is a promising deal for anti-COVID-19 drug discovery. So with this, let's watch our webcast. Good morning, participants, fellow speakers, distinguished guests, and students attending the webinar on USP-USP Joint Symposium. I am Alan Patrick Macabeo, and I am the principal investigator of the Laboratory for Organic Reactivity, Discovery, and Synthesis. 
Before I kick off, allow me to thank the Department of Biological Sciences for this honor of sharing the latest activities in my laboratory through this co-hosted international webinar. Our laboratory's activities cover a, a different aspects of organic chemistry that include molecular biodiscovery of potential drug materials from plants and fungi, construction of simple to complex molecules, and design of reactions, and finally, integration of computational chemical biology to understand process underlying the activity of our disease mitigating compounds. My talk this morning is about our recent exploration on the antagonistic effects of mixobacterial derived metabolites against the receptor binding domains of the SARS-CoV-2 spike proteins. This work is an offshoot to our preliminary drug discovery works on the multi-targeting capacities of repurposed fungal natural products and published in the Journal of Biomolecular Structure and Dynamics. So why the interest on anti-COVID-19 drug discovery? The novel coronavirus SARS-CoV-2, the causative agent of the disease COVID-19, emerged in December 2019. Since then, it has caused rapid transmission across country borders, forcing lockdown of communities in many countries, affecting not only health, but caused a huge negative impact on the social and economic well-being of individuals and the world in general. Currently, there is no licensed drug available for SARS-CoV-2. Although several drugs have been repurposed, and currently undergoing clinical trials to test their efficacy and safety in the treatment of COVID-19. However, given the rippled effect of this pandemic and the lack of a promising target-specific drug, an urgent call to discover effective therapeutic agents to combat the SARS-CoV-2 virus is still very much in demand. The discovery of a drug is a very complex process which includes interdisciplinary efforts for designing effective, safe, and commercially feasible drugs. As a matter of fact, the process of discovery and development is not only very challenging, but also expensive and time-consuming. For a highly contagious epidemic such as COVID-19, the scientific community is scoring and pressured in search for a cure and a vaccine. And we all know is that this scientific endeavor is a race against time. Over the past few years, modern drug discovery has been accelerated due to the development and advancement of bioinformatics and computational methodologies. Computer drug design, also known as in silico screening, has become a powerful tool because of its utility in various phases of drug discovery and development. Drug in drug discovery pipeline, as illustrated in this slide, the process occurs in three stages. The initial phase is target identification. Before one can develop a drug, there needs to be a specific target. This could be a protein, for example, which drives disease progression by which you design your drug around. And for successful computer-aided drug design research, access to an acceptable and validated three-dimensional target protein structure is vital. This is where bioinformatics and structural biology comes in. In the case of COVID-19, the complete genome was made available last January 2020, which can be retrieved from the NCBI with the following reference sequence. Sites such as Swiss model by the Center of Molecular Life Sciences Sang Lab and the RCSB Protein Data Bank provided a genome-wide structure and function modeling of SARS-CoV-2. After deciding on a particular protein as a drug target, computational methodologies can aid in discovery of a lead and lead opti in lead optimization. The word lead refers to a chemical compound that shows promise as a treatment for a disease and may fail to the development of a new drug. The commonly used in silico lead identification and optimization methods can be categorized into either structure-based and ligand-based approaches. 
The third stage of the pipeline is the subjection of the lead compounds to preclinical tests such as toxicity and pharmacokinetic slash ADME prediction study. ADME stands for absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. Drug-like predictions such as physiochemical ADME and toxicity properties are an integral element of drug discovery projects. Properties uh, of interest include structural properties, physicochemical properties, biochemical properties, and pharmacokinetic and toxicity properties. Molecular docking is one of the most frequently used methods in structural based drug discovery or structured based drug discovery because of its ability to predict with a substantial degree of accuracy the conformation of a small molecule which acts as ligands within the appropriate target binding site of a protein which acts as the receptor form a stable complex. Basically, it attempts to find the best match between molecules. In here, investigations involving crucial molecular events are conveniently performed, which includes ligand binding modes and the corresponding intermolecular interactions that stabilize the ligand receptor complex. Furthermore, molecular docking algorithms execute quantitative prediction of binding energetics, providing rankings of dock compounds based on the binding affinity of respective complexes. In our laboratory, we are interested in protein targets that are implicated in diabetes, inflammation, neurodegenerative diseases, obesity, and infectious diseases. Molecular dynamics is another tool in theoretical study of biological molecules. As mentioned earlier, the flexibility of a protein ma macromolecule, and for this tool, that is the essential or major consideration. It basically calculates the time-dependent behavior of a molecular system meaning the ligand protein complex as it undergoes conformational changes during the molecular recognition process where detailed information on fluctuations are noted. In drug discovery and development programs, understanding the pathogenesis of the disease is very important. For COVID-19, the life cycle of SARS-CoV-2 begins with the binding of its viral spike through host cell receptors of the cell membrane. The primary entry of the virus is mediated by ACE2 or angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptors forming complexes with these proteins. Another possible route of entry to the host cell, a secondary mode of entry, is through binding with the chaperone protein glucose regulated protein 78 or GRP 78. The spike protein is a transmembrane glycoprotein studying the viral surface. Structurally, it bestows the coronavirus its name for, its give, give, uh, for it gives a crown-like appearance to the virus seen at electron microscopy. Functionally, its main purpose is to recognize attached to host receptor proteins to initiate viral entry to host cells. The spike recognizes multiple host receptors such as ACE2, CD147, and GRP78 through its receptor binding domain. Upon recognition and attachment, the virus enters host cells and begins, make, and begins making multiple copies of its genome through replication and uh, ultimately infecting other cells in the process. Because of its functional significance, it is a very attractive drug target. Hence, we selected the spike protein as the target of mixobacterial natural products. We utilized bioinformatic tools to explore the potential antagonistic properties of mixobacterial metabolites. Among the 72 met metabolites screened in silico, we identified the chondromides or the cyclic uh, mixobacterial depsy peptides to exhibit the highest affinity towards the spike protein receptor binding domain. Shown in this image are the top eight hits for spike wild type spike protein. In particular, the mixobacterial chondramide CT demonstrated the highest 
binding energy towards wild type spike protein at minus 8.7 kilocalories per mole. However, we see a drop in the binding energy when C3 was docked towards the mutants N501Y and E484K. These variants represent the mutations in the RBD of the UK and African slash Brazilian variants respectively. This observation prompted us to analyze the duct pose of chondromite C3 when bound to the spike RBD. The image on the left demonstrates the duct pose of chondromite C3 to the RBD of wild type spike. We observe that the phenol and indole rings of chondromide C3 are important in forming intermolecular interactions with the spike RBD. With these interactions, the binding energy is diminished as seen in both N501Y mutation and E484K mutation. Interestingly, chondromide C3 exhibited a high affinity to other spike variants except N501Y and E484K. An important difference among the variants is the type of mutation that occurs in the RBD of the spike protein. Then there are two types of mutations, conservative and non-conservative. A conservative mutation would entail an amino acid substitution that preserves or maintains the function and shape of the amino acid being replaced. Whereas a non-conservative mutation changes the property of the amino acid which may affect the property of the protein. N501Y and E484K are examples of non-conservative type mutation versus the other variants that are characterized with conservative type mutation. In contrast with chondromide C3, chondromide C exhibited a high affinity towards the wild type spike as well as the spike variants. We also see the importance of the indole and phenol rings in stabilizing the compound's interaction with the spike RBD despite N501Y and E484K mutations, after which we then investigated what accounts for the observed binding energy difference among the compounds. Hence, we compared the structure of the compounds and did structure activity relationship studies. Looking back at the top eight metabolites, we can appreciate the difference between chondromide C3 and C. The phenol of chondromide C3 contains a chlorine atom situated at the ortho position. The presence of an electronegative substituent such as chlorine on phenol hinders intermolecular hydrogen bonding against certain polar residues due to the participation of the hydroxyl group in H bonding with the ortho substituent intramolecularly which in turn affects the polarity of the compound. Other metabolites that exhibited an increase in binding affinity towards N501Y compared to the wild type are chondromides D, compound 4, E2, compound 5, and A9, compound 8. Similar to compound 2, compound 4 does not have an orthochlorine on the phenol group. Compounds 5 and 8, on the other hand, fashion a hydroxyl substituent alpha to the ester and a glycosylated phenol, respectively. The data support our observation that having a free or no ortho substituent in the phenol moiety or further oxidation of the chondromide 4 would increase binding to, the, to certain RBD variants, particularly those with non-conservative mutation. After determining the binding affinities of the chondromide towards point-mutated SARS-CoV-2 spike variants, the compounds were subjected to molecular docking against recently known strains with more than one amino acid substitution in the spike RBD's RBD sequence. The South African variant N501Y, E484K, K417N, and the Brazilian variant N501Y, E484K, K417T. 
given as how chondromide C or compound 2 perform in terms of binding against the singly substituted spike variants N501Y and E484K, it is no surprise that this compound exhibited strong affinities against the South African and Brazilian variants. The mutation from lysine to either asparagine or threonine, respectively, kept the polar nature of the residue, which probably aided in the accommodation of polar ligands. In summary, we highlight the importance of screening compounds against SARS-CoV-2 spike variants in order to demonstrate how the chemical structure of compounds affect affinity. Our results offer uh, important structural insights for future researches in anti-COVID run discovery, targeting spike protein. We then perform protein-protein docking in order to demonstrate the ability of the bound chondromide on the spike protein to hinder its attachment to multiple host receptors such as ACE2, CD147, and GRP78. ACE2 is the main route of entry of the virus and is abundantly expressed in the respiratory epithelium, whereas CD147 is expressed in activated T lymphocytes. Infection of T cells secondary to SARS-CoV-2 entry is one of the causes of lymphopenia a characteristic finding in patients with COVID-19 that is associated with severity. Now, let us focus on these two receptors. Interestingly, ACE2 and CD147 are recognized by similar residues in the spike protein RBG. Through our docking studies, we demonstrated that chondromide C3 is able to form intermolecular interactions with residues of the spike RBG shared by ACE2 and CD147. Therefore, we reveal the potential of chondromide C3 as antagonist to spike protein binding to both ACE2 and CD147. To further validate our finding, we perform protein-protein docking. Figure A shows chondromide C3 at the interface of the spike RBD and ACE2 receptor, while figure B de demonstrates C3 at the interface of spike RBD and CD147. Protein-protein docking studies demonstrate the ability of chondromide C3 to hinder hinding of spike towards ACE2 and CD147 receptors, which is supported quantitatively with decreased HADAC scores. Okay, before I end, I would like to acknowledge um, the people behind this project. So foremost, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Ray Arturo T. Fernandez, who was the lead computational uh, biologist for this uh, work. And also uh, my graduate students and research staff, Mark, Omar, and John Eric. I would also like to acknowledge uh, Kin Israel Notarte of the Faculty of Medicine and Surgery and the medical biology, student, biology students of the College of Science, namely Von, Joe, and Ina. Thank you for listening, and I would be glad to answer questions related to the lecture. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much, Professor Alan Makabeo. Uh, at this point in time, may we ask our presenters, Father Nicanor, uh, Dean Alano, April Uy, and Professor Alan Makabeo to please turn on your cameras so that you will be recognized. At this point, we'll have a question and answer opportunity for all of our uh, attendees, you have two options. The first option is you may type in your question at the chat box or one at a time, you may raise your hands using the reactions like this. Okay. And then once we recognize your uh, intent, we'll call upon you, then you can ask your questions. Okay, so please go ahead. Who would like to ask a burning question?
I actually have a question for our Japanese co uh, colleagues. I'm just wondering what vaccine hesitancy is like in Japan. Thank you very much, Father Nicanor. Uh, would any of our Japanese colleagues would like to elaborate? Okay. Okay, I will answer. My name is Emiko Hanada. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, I don't have a, a, a actual data how, how many uh, Japanese hesitate the vaccination. However, the uh, uh, general uh, uh, Japanese opinion to the uh, general vaccination, the, there are some people has also a uh, hesitation to the vaccination. The, I mean general uh, classic infections for measles and mumps. The several people have still uh, hesitation. And uh, your uh, second student reported that around 6% um, of the uh, people hesitated in the uh, vaccination. The, I think it's quite similar to Japanese situation. Uh, I have also uh, another question. The uh, 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 infection to the uh, to classic infection, are they obligated to uh, Philippines uh, people? Uh, for example, measles, or otherwise uh, chicken pox, are they obligated to uh, Philippine people? Uh, thank you for that question. I actually do not know how to answer that question. And I'm just wondering if any of uh, my Filipino colleagues is aware of the requirements for vaccination in the Philippines at this time. Uh, well, on my end, as a uh, common citizen, uh, it seems that in each of the LJUs, for example, in my city and the Polo city, they have rolled out the registration for the vaccine. However, we're not really as sure as to when we will receive it. Uh, this initiative is happening in many different cities like Pasig City. And uh, recently we saw that in Makati, it is also evident. How, how about the, the childhood vaccinations like measles and, and chicken pox, the MMR vaccine? Are these required for Filipino children? Um, maybe I can answer based on some uh, previous experience. Uh, I know that if you consult the, your, the, the pediatricians, of course, uh, right after um, the child is born, um, a series of vaccin vaccinations are, are recommended. And um, it's just that I am not sure if these are required. But um, your, your pediatrician should um, uh, have a series of them uh, recommended uh, immediately after birth uh, and then several booster shots after until uh, you get the complete, uh, well, yeah, MMR, etc., are, are usually the ones that are being um, asked. Thank so, you, Dean Papa. Okay, I will explain the Japanese situation. The, uh, previously, when um, we were a child, the, uh, some uh, classical infections, for, uh, including measles and uh, chicken pox, they are obligated, um, almost obligated to all the uh, children. However, after that, some uh, sub, sub effect of the uh, uh, immunization uh, is problem, social problem. The, after that, uh, it has changed into uh, immunization is strongly recommended. However, it is not obligated to uh, the people. The, even, uh, even now, some uh, people are afraid of vaccination um, because of the subside effect. Um, uh, uh, some terrible uh, problem occurs when, when we are uh, children. Um, the, um, right, right now, the, the safety of the, the vaccines for COVID-19, uh, it is unclear. So that's why uh, some people 
are strongly afraid of the, um, the, the effect of the uh, uh, balance of effect of uh, vaccination and subside effect. Mm. Any other Thank opinion? You. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Harada Sensei, for giving us a, an idea of the Japanese situation. Uh, one question uh, for Sir Alan. Uh, sir, how difficult is the process when you're trying to study the chondromides for, in this instance, SARS-CoV-2 identification? Uh uh good morning so um uh in what instance uh is the difficult uh description is pertaining to oh is it about uh, uh my mindset is uh since i see this as a very interdisciplinary approach mm -hmm. could you give us uh like a glimpse of the process of how it's actually done and how difficult it is? Or is it something that uh, if you're a microbiologist, uh, what additional skills do you need to oh, have okay. to be able to study it? Thank okay. you. Okay, right. So uh, I wouldn't say it is difficult because um, actually I had myself trained for this uh, be, uh, since the expertise is of my, uh, my uh, PhD student from Mindanao uh, University, Mindanao State University, um, whose uh, expertise is in computational chemistry. So, um, I mean, of course, everybody knows that uh, I do hardcore organic chemistry. I'm not into the computational side. But then um, when I had the training along with the medical biology students like Vaughn, Joe, Eno, so I, I think it wasn't that hard. I, I mean, as long as you have your laptop, at least it's uh, 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 Intel 5 or seven because uh, what we need here is um, a laptop or a PC system that can stand the energy requirement of the computational process. So um, yeah, I, I think the only challenge is the, uh, the capacity of the, the laptop, but otherwise, if you are skilled in a computer and you have uh, a basic knowledge of organic chemistry, like uh, the basic ones, uh, intermolecular attraction, functional groups, and uh, all these things, it should be very easy. And also uh, the processing is, uh, I, I mean, uh, we have a step-by-step -step protocol that was, uh, that was established by my graduate students. In fact, uh, Vaughn, Eno, and Joe are, are also training other medical biology guys who are very much interested in doing this uh, computational biology thing and uh, want to integrate it in their uh, projects. So we have actually recruited oh, uh, Sophia, uh, Morgan Tan, and uh, Jan Munoz also. So uh, it's very easy. It's only a two hour training and then you can do it by yourself. Thank you very much. So this is an eye opener to many of the students who are present now, even our master students who would actually want to explore computational biology in relation to organic chemistry. Yes. Uh, we have a question. Uh, Nikki, go ahead. Yes, thank you, JC. Actually, my question first, at first, I would like to first create a comment uh, for our first two presenters. It was a very interesting and eye-opening presentation about COVID-19. Um, however, my question is not actually a question, but more of a commentary that um, I would like to personally congratulate, of course, the COVAX team for creating such initiative, particularly for us Filipinos right now who are having a lot of fear, particularly when we talk about vaccination here in the country. But um, now my, my, not really a question, but I, I would just like to find out, um, especially to the students who work with Father Ostriaco, like how is the response now of this initiative particularly that you're targeting social media right like um how is the response of the students or the people who are uh using this platform and secondly um is it even for example reaching the other um remote areas for example in the country for example in the visayas or in the mindanao are we also getting some response from from that 
So Dean or April, who would like to answer? Well, but, um, yes, sir, uh, Compared to the previous surveys done by Pulse Asia, for example, they conducted face-to-face -face interviews and they were able um, to reach those remote areas that we were not able to reach. So that's uh, a primary difference with, uh, between our team and theirs since we're conducting online surveys. Uh, another thing, we're, we're making an information campaign on several social media platforms. Um, we are still striving to get the wider scope. Uh, we are working with uh, other institutions so that our, our publication materials could uh, be received by more people. We are working on that, uh, particularly by the social media team. And I think Dean Alano can go into further detail. Thank you for that. Um, in addition to what April have shared with us, um, we are actually working with institutions in such a way that uh, those institutions that has greater reach. Uh, for example, since we are undergraduate students, we are reaching with organizations in Visayas, in Mindanao, our counterparts, for example, so that organizations as well, who would be able to um, share with them, uh, share with, the, with their students there, uh, their um, fellow, our fellow Filipinos there, our, our response, and of course, the truth about COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, just uh, actually, uh, we have just began actually um, one of our initiatives, which is to reach other institutions as well, which of course we will be sooning name in the near future when we are when we have already secured the partnerships with them. But at the same time, all of this is in response to what um, we have seen that there are really vaccine hesitancy in the Philippines. At the same time, we would also like to highlight that um, in this kind of um, initiative, um, it is quite, of course, challenging to reach our remote areas. That's what's, that's that's just that what April said. But at the same time, it is also quite um, challenging actually to combat misinformation because um, you, would, you would see that while, of course, there are um, groups like the COVAX that's really spreading awareness, there are really people who's really working uh, with misinforming other people. So that's what we are really looking forward to. That's why the COVAX-19 testimonies, uh, we hope, will um, really motivate other people to actually get vaccinated and actually listen to what's the truth about vaccines because these are statements coming from people who just get vaccinated. And soon enough, since we have already started our efforts here in the Philippines, uh, we will also soon hear enough from frontline healthcare workers who just got vaccinated. So we hope uh, that will also help our um, efforts. Thank you very much, Dean, for that uh, very inspiring and very clear response. Uh, we are happy to see that our undergraduate students are now become very involved in national issues. Um, we can see right now that we're just about to finish our first open forum. Uh, let us give a warm appreciation for our speakers for this session by pressing the clap reaction in our Zoom meeting. Thank you very much, Father Nicanor, Dean, April, and Professor Makabe. So this wraps up the first session on COVID-19 research. Okay. So now to continue, we will be turning from COVID-19 research going towards forest and agriculture education. We will have two speakers for this session. For our first distinguished speaker, he finished his studies, Bachelor's of Agriculture in Kyoto University, Japan. He then finished his Master's of Management in the Kellogg Graduate School of Management in Northwestern University, USA. His current field of specialization is environmental resource economics, environmental and resource management, voluntary initiatives, eco certification, and sustainable management. Among of many his credentials, he is a corporate, uh, he is involved in the corporate social responsibility and environmental management 
in Wiley as an editorial board member in this journal. His research experience is vast and wide, going into from natural resource management policy, even towards climate change. He is currently a professor in the School of Environmental Science of the University of Shiga Prefecture. For this, let us all welcome Professor Takuya Takahashi, PhD. Thank you for the introduction. So let's start uh, my presentation. Hi. Hello, uh, my name is Takuya Takahashi and I would like to present our about our experiences uh, during this pandemic. And uh, this is the background uh, you may be you may be well aware of. So uh, due to this pandemic, all courses at our university had to go online. And uh, especially uh, courses such as field work or experiments had difficulty adjusting to these new situations. So uh, the purpose of this presentation is to share experiences and thoughts, our thoughts during this period. And uh, we would like, to, I would like to come up with new ideas and action plans for the future. So here is the background of our environmental fieldwork courses. So for freshmen, for freshmen, so for freshmen, uh, fieldwork one uh, is offered and uh, this course consists of four units and uh, all students all freshmen had to go through these four units and maybe our colleague will present about this uh, field work one uh, in another presentation and uh, our our i would like to present about field work two uh, this course is for sophomore and uh, students can choose uh, the course which they would like to get into and uh, there are 10 courses and our course is wood and life see the description of wood and life uh, wood and life is to allow students to experience multidisciplinary aspects of the relationship between wood and human life such as forest ecosystems forest policies and wood, and wood value chain and etc and every year uh, students and instructors take bus trips to sites where they can observe forests and log yards and etc but this year we couldn't do that so uh, uh, here are the instructors and uh, uh, these instructors are from four different departments. So uh, this structure, this composition uh, gives this course a multidisciplinary flavor. And uh, first unit, uh, first uh, part of our fieldwork course is about the first ecosystem. Uh, this consists uh, in, last, in the last year, in the last year, in the last academic year, uh, consists of real visit to neighboring mountain and group presentations. And this year, we had to uh, do video recording and individual report on topics. So this is the picture of the very uh, in the past year and. Uh, so students uh, go to a forest and they could by themselves take a look at what 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 are uh, what is forest system looks like but it was cancelled so this is a view a view from uh, our campus uh, of um, mount kojinyama so uh, the professor kogotani uh, explains about the uh, shape of leaf of Japanese kind of work. 
and he is now telling about the difference between hardwood and softwood, uh, broadleaf tree and uh, needleleaf trees. And right now, uh, we are looking at uh, Japanese cypress a plantation forest. And uh, he is right now recording while he uh, was walking uh, and uh, recording at the same time. And we now how uh, here is a butterfly uh, flying. And this is a nice view from a uh, point uh, close to the mountain top. And uh, you can see our campus, USP campus on the left hand side and the Mount Ibuki. Beautiful sight. And next uh, component of this course is value chain of wood. So in the previous year, uh, we paid real visits to uh, various sites, but this year we replaced it with uh, a video recording and lectures from uh, practitioners. And uh, this was a picture from previous years, uh, from the previous years. So that was cancelled. So this is the recording uh, of the first uh, re logging site. You can see a tree was well done. And this is a logging machine, a so called harvester. Uh, this harvest trees and uh, cut, uh, cut down uh, branches and cut to lengths. Uh, and uh, this is the, a site of a uh, log auction market. And uh, he is uh, running this place. And uh, right now he's talking about what kind of uh, logs are good for producing sawn timber. Uh, what types of trees are good. And next, uh, we go to uh, sawmill. And uh, you can see how uh, a log is sawn into sawn timber uh, like this. And he is also, he's running at this sawmill and uh, house building company and uh, he now explains what kind of defects are found in uh, uh, timber and next we go to uh, this is uh, Nagahama public library Nagahama city library and this new built library uh, in this library uh, locally uh, locally harvested trees are used uh, for interior uh, decoration. So uh, students can learn how to use uh, this uh, locally sourced uh, timber. And next, uh, wood processing or wood joineries. So in the previous year, we went to uh, neighboring prefecture, a uh, GIF prefecture, GIF Academy of Forest Science and Culture and learned a lot. Uh, and we and students uh, themselves uh, made wood joineries using chisels and hammers. But this year, uh, we couldn't do that. Do that. So this is a picture from previous years, and from uh, previous years. So uh, people, uh, students, uh, experience this way how to make wood joineries. So this year, uh, we, uh, we requested students to make a uh, paper craft wood joinery, a uh, kind of uh, substitute for real, real experience. So they made wood joinery using wood, uh, using not wood, uh, but paper, 
one. And also, uh, we asked them to find out joineries from their neighborhood. And many of them, uh, many of the students come from Kyoto and they stayed home and they couldn't come to school or university. So uh, they found wood joineries. For example, uh, these are uh, wood joineries found uh, in a temple, at a temple in Kyoto. And some students uh, went to grandpa and grandmother's uh, house and maybe a little bit old house and uh, found wood joineries in that house. And uh, some people, uh, some student went to uh, a Starbucks and uh, found interesting wood joineries and uh, student, some students went to a uh, house building site uh, and found how actually wood joineries are used. And next part, uh, wood decomposition or mushroom. And also we, uh, in the last year, we went to uh, Takatoriyama Forest Park and uh, found uh, several real, of course, uh, mushrooms. And we grew a mushroom under different conditions. Uh, and this year, we asked students to report on five species of mushrooms they like. And this is uh, the site, a site of uh, mushroom growing in previous, in a previous year. And it was canceled. So uh, they uh, look for mushrooms mainly in the internet and found interesting mushroom species. And how uh, do students, did students perceive about uh, this field of course? And this is, every year we uh, conduct the surveys and uh, uh, this is how much, uh, uh, how much about the topics interesting for you and uh, not much difference between last year and this year. And next, and uh, uh, how much actively did you participate in class? So uh, surprisingly, uh, this year, uh, more people actively uh, participated in this course. And next, uh, how do you evaluate the instructor's advice? Not much difference uh, between the last year and this year. And all in all, how much are you satisfied with the course in general? Uh, again, uh, the proportion of very satisfied students are somewhat increased. Uh, but there are some students who were neutral uh, about the evaluation uh, that may be caused by the loss of real experiences. And uh, these are three descriptions about this course. And uh, so what kind of abilities do you think you have gained in this course? Uh, presentation skills, or information, uh, how to collect information and judge the credibility of uh, those, the information and other abilities. And many students actively uh, answer to this free description part of this survey. And these are thoughts from instructors. Uh, Professor Kagotani, uh, says uh, loss of realities such as physical exp experience of walking around the forest, touching trees, feeling the atmosphere, uh, these are lost. And loss of group work experiences. But this is also a good opportunity to evaluate the contents of classes. And next, my 
uh, thought. And I think uh, this could be a this could be a new opportunities for connecting with remote uh, domestic or even overseas. And Professor so Takada uh, felt sorry for the fact that students could not make wood joineries on their own, nor test uh, the strengths of the joineries by breaking them with the experimental machine. And the types of paper crafts of wood joineries can be diversified. And Professor Ilya said that uh, limited use of online formats due to low capacity of on offline internet connections and it, it was difficult to give uh, souvenirs to online guests due to the accounting rules. Another problem. So thank you very much for watching and I welcome your questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Thank Takahashi. You. That was a very educational uh, presentation. We actually feel very similar because last semester uh, during the summertime, we were forced to teach field biology online. <laughs> <laughs> so we have very similar experiences. Mm. Thank, um, you. Thank you. From this field work to online, a case of wood for life, we will now transition to plant cultivation education. And this will be led by uh, another prominent invited speaker. Our invited speaker studied in the Osaka University Faculty of Pharmaceutical Sciences. He also, she also finished her studies in the Nara Institute of Science and Technology Graduate School of Biological Science for her doctorate degrees. She has had many experiences in terms of research history, one of which would be a research fellow in the Kyoto University Research Institute for a Sustainable Humanosphere. He was, uh, she was also a department chair uh, from April 2020 to present. She has multiple research areas from environmental science and agriculture towards environmental load reduction. And her research interests span a lot from micro bubbles, DNA barcoding, phytoremediation to her particular talk today, which is regarding cultivation education. She is currently a professor from the School of Environmental Science, Department of Biological Resource Management of the University of Shiga Prefecture. Let us all welcome Professor Emiko Harada, PhD. And Thank you for your kind introduction. Uh, could you please start my uh, pre-recorded video? Hi. Hello everyone, my name is Emiko Harada. I am a faculty staff in the Department of Biological Resource Management in School of Environmental Science in the University of Singapore. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to give a talk here in online symposium. Now I'll start the presentation. Today, I will talk about establishment of a remote training course on cultivation. This attempt is a cooperation with my call. 
Professor Tatsuya Uemachi in the same department. In our School of Environmental Science, we have four departments. In our department, main topics are related to agriculture, forestry, fisheries, and environment. Here, you can see the outline of my talk. First, I will introduce you our laboratory course for group science, programs before COVID-19. Next, I will show you our attempt to establish an interactive lab course this year. After that, I will discuss the advantages and the limitations in the remote learning course. Biological Management Lab 1 is a course for crop science. It is held in summer semester from April to July, and four faculty staffs are uh, uh, instructed in this course. Around 50 student participants were divided into groups with six to eight members. And this course is conducted in both laboratory and the field, including farm state. The aim of this program is to obtain the skills for cultivation of the crops, and to survey and understand the physiological functions of plant. Rice, wheat, soybean, and ornamental plants are used for the program. Here you can see the several pictures. This is our farm state. Uh, this uh, course is mainly conducted um, here before COVID-19. This is a little bit old picture. Students were planting the rice all together. This is also old picture. Students are harvesting the wheat. Here you can see my uh, program, formation of module on soybean root. Formation of module on soybean uh, depends on the symbiosis between legumi plant and rhizobia. This is a nitrogen fixation soil bacteria. After successful symbiosis, we can see the module on the surface of the uh, root where plant obtain nitrogen or bacteria. Soybean plants were cultivated in this course with and without rhizobia. Students grow the plant around two months. You can see in this picture the different chlorophyll content between control and rhizobia tolerated plants. Students student also cultivated soybean under controlled condition in the laboratory. And then they observed the module under spectroscopy. Students work together to obtain the result like this. This year, summer semester, we are under a soft lockdown. And lectures must be performed the remote on demand style. The, in the case of Bravo course, we have to uh, we have select one remote on demand course or intensive course in August. Otherwise, we have to cancel everything. We four faculty staff discussed uh, about it and decided to remote on demand course. And our mission is how can we establish an effective remote program for plant cultivation? And we said this, uh, these three kind of programs. One is remote lab course one, formation of nodules on the root of soybean instructed by me. And remote lab course two, evaluation of cold treatment on germination 
by using refrigerator at home. This course is instructed by Professor Uyamachi. And the other two faculty staff conducted on-demand lectures. In this talk, I will introduce two uh, labo remote lab courses. First, a uh, remote lab course one, formation of nodules on the roots of soybean. We decided to send all the materials to each student first. Uh, there are some examples. Here you can see the rhizobia. This is commercially available. And also seeds. Here you can see the soybean seed. Also we prepare other seed, komatsuna, and corn and pirira. Komatsuna is a kind of brassica vegetable. And the seed and the rhizobia, garden soils, small cultivation containers, labels are put in the box and sent to student purpose. Here you can see the residence of our students. Many students live in Siga Prefecture and also uh, neighbor prefectures. However, some uh, students live so far from here. One student lives live in Ehime. Uh, it is another island in Japan. Plant uh, cultivation and monitoring the growth of soybean is performed as a form of Sewing start in the end of May, and the student will plant and then after one week and cultivate it further until the beginning of July. After successful symbiosis, students observe the emotion shown with red arrows, and they count up and harvest them. and report the size of the largest nodule they uh, obtain. And the student cut the nodule to observe the cross section to see the color of the nodule. Many students use magnification glasses and some students have USB microscope. I also had USB microscope and obtained several pictures by using that and distribute uh, the images and movies to students. Red color shows the existence of active hemoglobin that indicates active nitrogen fixation in the nodules. Because it was impossible to show the real object. Text pictures as well as movies were used to explain the, explain the experimental procedure. Here you can see the uh, small movie obtained by USB uh, microscope. Uh, I cut the nodule to show the sections and observe the color. It is a red that shows the active nitrogen fixation is occurring inside of the nozzle. I will repeat that again. Cut. And you see, this is a red color in the nozzle. Next, I will introduce uh, another lab course uh, instructed by Professor Uematsi Shotai. Evaluation of cold treatment on germination by using refrigerator at home. Students uh, use three kinds of uh, sheep, komatsuna, corn, and pirira. Komatsuna and corn, uh, pirira, they are temperate vegetables. Corn is a subtropical vegetable. And cold treatment was performed before and after germination and this experimental design is up to each student. This plant reacts differentially to the cold treatment because of their origin. 
after finishing the course, we collected the voice of the student. Some students are very positive. I was very happy to be able to cultivate the plan. My family also enjoyed the observations of growth of soybean. And some students had actually problem. My grant died during the experiment. One student reported, my father discarded my seeds in refrigerator by mistake. However, these troubles did not affect the score as long as the student submitted the report in time. We discussed uh, about the uh, effect of this course. Here you can see our opinions. No free rider. We had uh, already noticed free rider problem. In group work, uh, some students work very hard and others observe the members only. Uh, this is free rider problem. However, as homework style, students were required to work on the subject by themselves. And especially for school, the student ideas are directly reflected in the experiment. Only small plants are available in remote lab course. However, we conclude it is not too bad. Here you can see the summary. Of my presentation. Seed and other material were sent to students per post in a lab course for crop science. The, the, this attempt rather promoted the initiative of the student. It is impossible to handle the large size and mature crops, including rice and wheat. It is obvious limitation of the food course. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Harada, for that very insightful uh, lecture on cultivating in an online environment. So Harad Sensei says, talk on the establishment of remote training course on cultivation uh, finishes the lecture aspect of the forest and agriculture education session. Now, may we ask uh, our speakers, uh, Professor Takahashi, as well as our other Japanese uh, counterparts and Filipino counterparts to keep their cameras open so that uh, we can initiate our open forum and question and answer. Uh, once again, if you have any questions, you can use the reaction found at the lower right section of Zoom. You can raise your hand like this one. At the same time, uh, you may put your question in the chat box. So, so please go ahead. Who would like to ask a question? Okay. Hi, Nikki. Please go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you, JC. Yeah, it's a very interesting uh, presentation to find out how our Japanese colleagues was able to cope up with the pandemic and especially applying it on their online uh, classes. I am just wondering if they have been able to experience also, for example, some students asking for deadlines for or extensions of their deadlines when they submit their oral reports? Or is there a limit on the number of experiments that they need to finish for the whole term? Or is what was your experience on those uh, matters? And my third question actually is, if they were also doing some uh, assessment, like uh, giving them an exam, um, what was their experience on on those uh, matters? So, excuse me. So, may I answer first? Okay. So, your first question is about uh, deadline. So, in our course, in our course about forests, uh, maybe not so many students asked for 
deadline ex extensions uh, because we intentionally reduce the workload for them. So not, not many uh, of them didn't require deadline extensions. And the second one is, I think, I guess that is uh, more about uh, Professor Harada's uh, presentation. And the third question is about, uh, but I, I forgot what question, excuse me. About but, the assessment, do you try to give, for example, quizzes also during uh, exam. the exam? So yeah. that, was a huge, that was a huge issue. Maybe a Professor Maruo, who was responsible for that issue, could talk a lot about that. But we decided, uh, basically, we don't have give them exams online because it's very difficult to perform fair and fair exam online. So we, we in our course, we just evaluated uh, students according to their reports and their uh, opinions or their, uh, their performance online in, uh, opinion exchange. Okay, that's my answer, thank you. Thank you very much, Takashi Sensei. Uh, maybe let's hear, oh, Marua Sensei would like to uh, comment before, after that, we're going to have uh, Harada Sensei. Harada Sensei, sorry. I'm 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 sorry. Half uh, 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 to this at uh, um, so first term uh, from uh, April to, uh, to July. Uh, we usually have the uh, uh, exam, so uh, the paper uh, to test examination. But uh, to this uh, this year, uh, school year, uh, we have uh, to no chance to uh, come to the university. Mm -hmm. And we, are, uh, uh, we think it's uh, uh, not safe uh, to get together with uh, uh, to have an exam in the classroom uh, because some uh, to class uh, to student uh, to more than a hundred students have the class. Mm. So uh, to avoid this uh, to situation, uh, to we have no exams. Mm. Just uh, to have uh, to evaluate with the reports mm. only. Thank you, Maruo Sensei, for that uh, clarification. But, but some uh, to, uh, to teachers for linguistics uh, has exams, but uh, so it's very hard <laughs> because uh, uh, to we can uh, uh, they have to check their uh, to pronunciation by mouse, so they send a uh, to movie to the uh, teachers. <laughs> it's very difficult to evaluate. Okay, uh, to, thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much, Marawa Sensei. Uh, Professor Harada, you would like to yes. comment on the same topic? Yes, thank you for your answer. Uh, first, I would uh, uh, answer to your question about the deadline of uh, this program and uh, submission of the report. Uh, uh, in my case, uh, if a student cannot submit the report in time, it strongly affects the score. Not zero point, but it affects the score. score. They, however, in this uh, program, the student had to carry out the, their experiment individually, and they, they had to start calculation in, uh, to, in, the, big, uh, in the end of May, uh, the, in the latest, the, in the beginning of July. They, otherwise, plant cannot grow well. They, so that really, um, they rather uh, promoted them to keep the uh, to, uh, 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 in time uh, submission of the report, I think. And uh, about the uh, examination, online examination, uh, actually I perform online examination by using Microsoft uh, Forms uh, and uh, the good score. However, I'm not I'm quite sure it is, uh, I can believe in that score or not. The, because students uh, easily <laughs> to interact during the, ex uh, no, during the examination. The, that is uh, no, also a problem uh, in remote course. I agree. Yeah, thank you. 
Thank you very much, Harada Sensei. Excuse me, I, maybe uh, Nikki asked about also the number of experiments or something like that. Okay. Yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, okay, okay. I, uh, I asked, like, did you reduce the number of uh, experiments that you gave during the online classes in comparison to your uh, oh. normal uh, classes, face to face classes? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, so the tasks uh, is a little bit reduced in online program the, because uh, the, uh, previously a uh, student get together and obtain one result. They each depend on the group work. However, they had to uh, perform by uh, one by one. That's why the, the total task is probably reduced. However, it is necessary for them to, uh, to um, conduct the work in uh, with initiative um, of each student. Thank you, Harada Sensei. Uh, Takahashi Sensei, please go ahead. Yes, on the chat in the chat uh, in the chat corner, uh, Sonia and sorry, Javier asked a question. Oh, do do they, they also have okay. rubric? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe <laughs> Harada Sensei. <laughs> Can you answer to that question? <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. The program has uh, changed uh, actually in the, uh, in the end of April. The, we start the school year in the end of April. The, however, uh, actually after that, we change the program. No, no, so, no, 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 excuse me. Uh, about the rubric. Rubric means the uh, score. score oh, yeah, yeah, rubric, yes, rubric. Uh, which, uh, to, uh, um, how many uh, scores are uh, uh, divided into program one, program two? Mm. Okay. Is it a rubric? Okay. Uh, hi, mm. Sensei. Mm. Uh, also, I think it represents uh, if you have a subjective output, maybe there is category on how to provide the score for each how to assessment. Provide the score. Uh, yes, yes. The, yes, um, the we uh, to distribute it new rubric after mm -hmm. the starting of uh, this uh, um, uh, laboratory course in this year. Yeah, sorry for interrupting <laughs> you, uh, <laughs> Professor Harada. Yeah, definitely we have rubric, very detailed rubric. Uh, but uh, to be honest with you, it's very difficult to, to judge based on that rubric. Uh, because that, that's uh, the field work courses are quite multifaceted, so it's very difficult to evaluate the, uh, all students based on that rubric. But we have that rubric, and uh, based on that rubric, we evaluate every student. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Marowo also commented the same, that uh, although there are a rubric, uh, they had to modify it uh, to accommodate online requirements. I think it is the same even for us here in the University of Santo Tomas. Um, there are some uh, details that you need to play into. Hi, Dino. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, actually, when it comes to the rubric, I have this rubric, for example, for free presentations. I ask students to limit their presentations to five minutes. But when the rubric is, when the presentation is pre-recorded, they can program it to five minutes so that well, I used that rubric back then when everything was face to face. So now I can't use that portion of the rubric to give them a grade because they can set their, they can time their presentations perfectly to five minutes. So there, there it really needs to be a modification with um, what we can do online. Um, maybe with submission time, maybe with a format, the specific format that you would need them to to their their submissions to be in. So I think. Uh, Definitely, there is a need to modify these rubrics. Thank you very much, Dino. Um, are there other co comments or questions with regards to this section on the forest and agriculture education session? Go ahead, Nikki. Yeah, this is a very interesting topic because we are all teachers here. So, and I know that, for example, forestry and agriculture is very applied based. You need to really teach the students the skills that they need to do in the field. So now because of this pandemic, uh, it halters that. And I'm wondering if 
your department has plans of of for example after for example if everything gets better to uh, create for example some bridging program or activities so that the students can really have a hands-on uh, feeling of the things that they need to learn on the field. Sorry, I couldn't actually understand uh, what your so, question. Yeah, the question is like, I'm wondering if uh, after, for example, if because the students didn't have really the field experience. Mm -hmm. So now I'm wondering like, if for example, everything gets better, mm -hmm and the students goes back to the university. Mm -hmm. um, is there any plan of your department to probably give the students another hands-on or bridging activity so that they will really have a hands-on experience on the things that they've missed during the semester? Oh, the oh, oh, oh. so a kind of compens compensatory yeah. Yeah. measures. <laughs> Actually, uh, for for our course, we don't have that kind of plan at this moment. For our course, for our uh, fieldwork course, we don't have that kind of uh, compensatory measures. But maybe that could be a good idea for uh, those students who couldn't experience uh, those real experiences this year. Maybe in the next, maybe in the next or next next year, some students can come and experience, for example, uh, using a hammer and chisel to make wood joineries or like that. Okay, that is a very good idea. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. How about you, Professor uh, Harada? Yeah, it is a little bit difficult. It's possible to, uh, for students to uh, uh, join the uh, the program next year because they couldn't handle the mature plant and large plant. Uh, so, um, however, because the limitation of the, uh, the participant number of participants, um, uh, it's it is a little bit difficult, I think. Thank you very much, Harada Sensei, for uh, giving us a mindset. Also, Takahashi Sensei. Um, everything that we're talking about up to this point is actually really related to the theme of the fourth USP-USP Joint Symposium, which is the challenges in science, education, and research in the new normal. Mm -hmm. So all of these ideas that we're formulating, uh, it will definitely be helpful for all of our institutions and all of the participants here today. And with that, we formally finish the forest and cultivation uh, education session for invited talks. At this point, we will now move on to the challenges in linguistic research. And for this, our esteemed speaker uh, is a professor from the University of Santo Tomas. She is currently the chair of the university's Centro Sa Salin at Araling Salin. She has had experiences as a consultant for communication, humanities, and the social sciences in many different universities. Uh, for one example, the Polytechnic University of the Philippines. She is also a reviewer of multiple social sciences and humanities journal, for example, Agos Journal from the University of the Philippines, Centro ng Wikang Filipina. Among her many recognitions is the 2019 Gawad Julian Cruz Balmaceda Awardee. Her research interest looks into translation studies in social linguistics and also intercultural, intercultural research. Her research highlight would be her involvement as a founding editor-in-chief of Hasaan Journal, the official referee journal of the University of Santo Tomas in the Filipino language. She finished her Doctor of Philosophy in Educational Management also in the University of Santo Tomas 
with the Latin honor of Summa Cum Laude. With this, let's all welcome Dr. Wendelin F. Fahilan. Hello, good morning to everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. JC, for the introduction. But first, I would like to correct <laughs> the detail on my doctorate degree. I did not finish uh, my doctorate degree in USD. Uh, uh, Instead, I finished my doctorate degree in the University of the Philippines with a degree of uh, doctor in philosophy major in Filipino translation studies. And we don't have any Latin honors at all. So I guess uh, we have to correct that first. So we, we, we can now proceed with the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Failan. Good morning. I am Assistant Professor Wenrin Fahilan from USD. And I am here to share my presentation on the challenges and opportunities in interdisciplinary research during the pandemic. This is an overview of the students' reflections on doing language research for the course Contextualized Communication in Filipino at the University of Santo Tomas. Before I begin, I would like to extend my gratitude to the organizers of this symposium, especially to the USD College of Science, for giving me a chance to share my experience in teaching language research. I hope that this presentation will encourage our Filipino scientists in empowering our national and local languages in the sciences. Advocates of Filipino have been pushing for the intellectualization of the national language for decades. They view the national language as a key in promoting a more democratic national communication and in developing an intellectual tradition rooted in culture and in the needs of the people. An intellectualized language is a standard language. One of the requirements of a standard language is to undergo language elaboration. According to Hogan, language elaboration refers to the terminology and stylistic development of a codified language to meet the communicative demands of modern life and technology. Its main area is the production of and dissemination of new terms. This means that for Filipino to be elaborated, it is used in different domains of knowledge with a standard vocabulary and orthography. It has dictionaries, thesaurus, encyclopedia, books, articles, and other relevant publications that will show the rich jargon of Filipino in different domains of knowledge. Since 2014, the removal of Filipino and literature courses in the general education curriculum has been initiated by the Commission on Higher Education as they push for the implementation of the new K-12 curriculum. Tanggol Wika, an alliance of advocates for Filipino in college, has filed a lawsuit against President Aquino and the Commission on Higher Education to counter this policy. A TRO was first ruled by the Supreme Court, enabling the continuation of Filipino courses in 2016 despite the implementation of the new curriculum. However, in 2019, the Supreme Court's final decision favored the Commission on Higher Education and they ruled that Filipino and the general education curriculum is optional. According to them, offering these courses is now based on the individual preferences of universities and colleges. This policy not only caused the removal of Filipino courses in the general education curriculum, but also the dissolution of Filipino departments in a lot of universities and colleges in the country. The University of Santo Tomas is among the higher education institutions that opted to continue offering Filipino and Pantican courses in the general education curriculum. The Commission on Higher Education did not release a guideline for the new Filipino courses. That's why the universities need to develop their own. For USD, the current GEC courses are Filipino 1, Contextualizado ng Comunicación sa Filipino, or Contextualized Communication in Filipino, and Filipino 2, Parinimulang Pagasali, Introduction to Translation in Filipino. These courses are designed to promote the relevance of Filipino as a general education course and advocate for the role of the university in the intellectualization of the national language. This presentation aims to highlight the feedback given by students from the College of Nursing 
of the University of Santo Tomas on their experience in doing language research as an output in their course on contextualized communication in Filipino in the form of a short intensive online course during the first term of school year 2020 to 2021. Using the students' reflections, this lecture presents the most important ideas they have learned, most like concepts, challenges in doing the research, skills they have developed, and their recommendations to future researchers. These narratives can be used as a guide in assessing the course outcomes and in enhancing the course design. It is based on the principle that learners are the main focus of teaching. Recognizing and utilizing their feedback is, an essential, is essential in empowering the learning process. The assessment task of the course is a research paper that maps the different meanings of a jargon from the learner's academic field. Researchers need to find the etymology, primary and secondary sense of the word, based on published definitions in academic publications, popular text, and multimedia presentation. They are expected to write a research paper and a reflection essay on their experiences as a language researcher. The students were given a sample paper as the basis of the expected output. One of the major requirements in writing the paper is the creation of their own concept map so that they can illustrate the different meanings of the word based on several academic disciplines as expressed in our example for the word virus wherein we can see the different meanings of this word from computer science, biology, medicine, and sociology. The lower part of the concept map also features the evolution of the word into a different uh, structure and meaning during the pandemic. This presentation features the reflections on the language research process of my three nursing one class. We formed six groups to create uh, distinct papers on a term that they deemed important in the elaboration of Filipino in the College of Nursing. These words are ginhawa, aruga, jeta, remedio, bato, and sinaw. Let us now discuss the student reflections on doing language research. There are five things that can be deduced from the narratives of the students regarding the most important ideas they learned from the language research process. First, group three says that they realize that doing language research is not light and easy because they need to undertake a lot of biases before, during, and after writing. So this means that they recognize the nature of the research process as a challenging activity. Second, group six says that the research is important to clarify the meaning and use of the word now in various aspects of communication as well as in writing and translation to avoid confusion among readers. This implies that the group knows the relevance of the topic in at hand. Third, according to group one, this research has helped them to realize that the Filipino language is the symbol of Filipino identity and culture. They also understood the importance of Filipino as a bridge for successful contextualized communication and globalization. Fourth, Group 3 says that the researchers became aware of the importance of translating words from various fields into the Philippine language, especially because most of their sources are from the English uh, references. Fifth and last, for the most important ideas learned, according to Group 4, the online class is a challenge, especially in the price of brainstorming. It means that some prices are more appropriate for in-person interaction. And let us now discuss the most liked concept of the groups. According to group six, it is amazing to know that a word can have so many meanings and uses and not just be limited to a single domain of knowledge. This is also illustrated in the appreciation of the group of the first group uh, in the meaning of Kinhawa. According to them, Ginhawa is not only used in expressing feelings of comfort and wellness 
in terms of physical health. It can also be used to indicate the state of overcoming one's problems and enjoying a comfortable state of mind. In addition, Group 6 also appreciates the different meanings of the word that they uh, featured on their research. They say that the group liked how beliefs are attached to the different meanings of the word sinaw, such as uh, steam and sore, sore mouth. For instance, Filipinos believe that the steam coming from the ground can cause pain or luck, and the remedy for your sore mouth is salt. It can be gleaned from these narratives how the findings of the research itself is appreciated by the student researchers. Let us now discuss the challenges in doing language research. First challenge is the limited quantity and quality of accessible references in the Filipino language. According to Group 6, finding materials from various fields in the Filipino language has been a challenge because most of the publications are only available in English. As a result, groups were compelled to translate the information into Filipino so that they can properly link the data to their discussion. Also, one of the groups says that most online references in Filipino are literal translations from English. Hence, there is a lack of evidence for the usage of the word based on the Filipino culture. Also, because of the online setup, the students have difficulty in finding possible sources of information on the subject because books, dictionaries, and other credible sources written in Filipino are not yet available in the digital format and online. These are only accessible in the university library reference section. Second, it is challenging to do research given the shortened schedule of the short intensive course. Hence, group four is very anxious to finish on time. The third challenge is the weather condition. According to group four, the suspension of classes caused by the series of typhoons resulted in the accumulation of academic activities in all their courses. Also, the typhoons affected the internet connection. When it rains, the signal weakens and to them, intermittent internet connection means that they cannot communicate well as a group. When it comes to the skills learned, because of the language research, three themes are very significant. First, the students learn critical thinking, they become resourceful, and they appreciate their translation skills in documenting and writing the research paper. Here are the recommendations of the students for future researchers. Group 4 says that they can expand the study by discovering more references in Filipino language and consulting with experts to support the current findings. Second, according to Group 2, they recommend that researchers look for other less commonly used words to further promote the Filipino language. Third, Group 1 suggests an alternative approach to word analysis by focusing on misinformation about the jargon to clarify understanding. And lastly, according to Group 5, they believe that there are more language domains that can be discussed so that their findings will be enhanced. The narratives also expressed the deeper appreciation of the students to the relevance of Filipino as an intellectualized language in the nursing profession. According to Group 1, although they rarely use Filipino in studying nursing, they realize that Filipino language continues to be necessary because it serves as an effective way to explain medical terms to patients. Also, according to Group 2, along with the expansion of our language is also the enrichment of our knowledge. This can be achieved through language research. As future nurses, if they have enough knowledge of the language, they will be able to express what they want to say to the patients more accurately and easily. Hence, nurses can do their job better if they have a rich and sufficient vocabulary. Lastly, according to Group 5, as nursing students, they need to know and understand the various allied health terminologies so that they can contribute in the intellectualization of Filipino language. In conclusion, this presentation discussed the student feedback in doing language research amidst the new normal. The course was successful in teaching students the nature of language research and the interdisciplinary aspect of Filipino. 
Studies show the importance of student feedback in assessing the design and implementation of the course. The narratives prove the student's ability to reflect on their own learning process and their role in enhancing course design. The goal to deepen the student's appreciation of the importance of the intellectualization of Filipino language was also achieved and expressed by their reflections on the subject. Therefore, it is worthwhile to continue teaching language research in the classroom. This presentation focused on one among 221 sections that studied contextualized communication in Filipino during the first term. If each section has five groups, and each group studies one academic term, there are more than a thousand words to be documented and analyzed by Tomasians in a single term. Based on the quantity alone, we can say that USD can lead in documenting and developing terminologies in different academic disciplines for intellectualization of Filipino. There is an opportunity to produce research at the institutional level, especially since the university is one of the leading advocates for Filipino, led by the Department of Filipino and the Center for Translation and Translation Studies. Researches made by the undergraduate students can be the starting point for graduate students and faculty researchers to, de to delve into language elaboration. Teams of researchers belonging to the same academic discipline can validate the student findings as most of them are practitioners in the field. It is high time that, that the university leads in this endeavor so that language research will not just end in the classroom. If this happens, we can come to a point when the use of Filipino as an intellectualized language becomes the new normal. Thank you very much and have a pleasant morning to everyone. Thank you very much, Dr. Wenderin, for that very insightful talk. Actually, uh, this comes close to heart to all of our Filipinos because uh, too many of our colleagues here, our Indonesian colleagues, our Japanese colleagues, they can actually write their papers, their scientific journals in their own language. However, the challenge for science education for us Filipinos is to definitely intellectualize our Filipino language. Uh, may we ask our colleagues, uh, faculty from Indonesia, from Japan, to open their cameras. Maybe you have some comments that you would like to uh, state. Yeah. So, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Professor Takashi. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so for us, it's very difficult to understand. Uh, actually, we are discussing on, online, line, 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 using line software. What is going on in the Philippines? Because we cannot, we couldn't understand what was going on. So, uh, for me, for me, maybe it's could it's very naive for us of uh, the philippine people uh, can easily understand english and speak english maybe it's not true so it would be very easy for you to write papers in english and make presentations in english so uh it's uh, in a sense we we think uh that's very fortunate for, for you to have English as second language. So the issues are not so easy, so, so not simple. So uh, so you must learn three languages. Do you have to learn three languages? So your own native tongue yes. and the official language, uh, yes. Filipino and English. Oh, so, uh, so uh, is it for you uh, very so uh, so uh, so uh, what what kind of situation do you think is ideal for Philippine people? So uh, you are pursuing in a sense uh, trilingual 
trilingual situation, you are, you are pushing for, you are advocating for a trilingual situation in a sense. Yes. I, I, I am, so I'm not so familiar with the situation. I would like to ask that question. So are you pursuing a trilingual situation? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. May I answer, Sir JC? Can you hear me? Uh, yes, Ma'am Wendelin, please go yes. ahead. Sir, uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, the ideal situation would be for the, our uh, local languages to be empowered to, you know, not, not only Filipino as the national language, because uh, we have a lot of indigenous concepts and I think even indigenous scientific concepts that are yet to be published and explored. Uh, when, when we talked about language research in the classroom here in Manila, the challenge is that we only uh, we only explore Filipino based in Tagalog, based on Tagalog. Mm -hmm. So I know that there are concepts in the uh, in other languages, and we have more than a hundred. We have at least hundred thirty uh, local languages that uh, that have their own tradition, indigenous tradition. So the ideal setup is for these languages to be empowered. Uh, we have to write a lot about them and then uh, document the multi the multilingual based mother language education that we are now implementing for the uh, primary schools primary schools so that uh, we can utilize the jargon or the uh, lexicon of these languages in uh, empowering Filipino the national language as an intellectual language so mm -hmm. I think that should be the scenario and of course we are also pleased that we can speak in English and, and use English as our uh, second language because uh, this is our a, con a connection with the world. So uh, I think that uh, Filipinos should not be uh, confused uh, because sometimes, uh, until now, uh, there are pro-English uh, professionals. And when you are a pro-English professional, you hate uh, accommodating Filipino and vice versa. So I think uh, the, the notion about uh, the competition between languages in the Philippines should be debunked. And think of our languages as our um, our treasures that we can utilize in empowering our uh, disciplines. Oh, that's great. That's quite interesting and yes. encouraging. Okay, thank you very much. So may I add up in, re with, in regards to that, may I add up that uh, actually I was excited to be part of this conversation, although I'm not a scientist. I am here to advocate for scientists, especially for Filipino scientists to really uh, look into it, you know, look into your own discipline, your, your, your scientific interest, and at least uh, I think uh, examine the potentials of uh, translating or even writing in Filipino so that we can disseminate uh, the scientific information education to our common uh, common uh, people because uh, for our foreign counterparts uh, we have to, we have to inform you that English is not the language of all Filipinos it is actually the language of the educated and the elite so the common Filipino who is uh, I think uh, usual Filipino who is below the poverty line or, uh, or considered uh, belong to the lower class is more f familiar and comfortable using their own uh, indigenous languages and Filipino, the second uh, language, because Filipino uh, based on Tagalog is also uh, 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 belonging to the Austronesian family of languages. So they can learn it easily than uh, English, who is uh, the uh, language that is far from the structure of our native languages. So uh, we have this challenge for intellectuals, professionals, not only from the sciences, but all professions, to really translate our knowledge and to Filipino and use our language so that we can uh, help our country better because uh, we have that divide. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, JC? I would just uh, like to, uh, maybe I would like to ask the question now, not to Wenny, but to our uh, collaborators here from Japan or maybe from Indonesia and even from uh, to Nikki. Because um, the problem with Filipinos in our educational system is that our references are in English. Even our textbooks are in English. So um, may I ask uh, if in Japan, do you use textbooks that are written in uh, Japanese? In, in Germany, do they use uh, textbooks written in German? So this means that the, the, the transfer of knowledge from the references to the ones reading the references are already direct. There is no need for an internal translation inside their heads for, it to, for the knowledge to be transferred. So I would just like to know uh, if this, if what is the situation in Japan or in Germany or in other countries that um, our participants are from? So maybe 
Professor Yukawa, our collaborator, can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, why? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, uh, so let me talk about the situation in social sciences. Almost all, all textbooks are translated into Japanese. Uh, but serious students who would like to get PhDs uh, may be encouraged to read English economics textbook uh, because there is that is the mecca of <laughs> uh, economics, uh, global economics. Okay, yeah. Yeah, in my experience also. I'm speaking on when I uh, on, on, the, on the experience of uh, being in Germany and being in Vietnam too. And what I've noticed is that uh, most of their references and textbooks, or even for example, their classroom instructions are taught on their languages. So the only time they actually, for example, in, in Germany, uh, most of the time they still speak German in their bachelors. And then they just start encouraging speaking English if they wanted to pursue uh, an international master's program. So you will really see that they are, um, so I'm speaking on behalf of my university in Germany, so that's how they do it. And I also observe even in Vietnam, that's how they do it. I know we have a Vietnamese participant here, and I noticed that most of them, they, they really use their language um, to as a medium of instruction. And, I, if I may add, you know, I've noticed, I will agree with what Dr. Pahilan have mentioned, like when I've used, for example, uh, the Filipino language as a medium of my instruction, it is easier for me to connect with my students and for them also to understand a very difficult concept in biology, for example. So I even try to use the... I don't know, the millennial language that they even use, for example, this gaming language that, that they are using just to connect with the students. And I noticed that it's easier for the students to feel comfortable even in the online platform. Huh? So they, they feel more comfortable to start discussing and not to be just quiet during the online classes because they feel comfortable, okay, I don't need, or they don't feel stressed to probably communicate in English. So that's just a sharing of what I have experienced so far also. Thank you very much, Nikki. Maybe we have a representative from Indonesia, uh, from Bogor University, from our attendees who would like to give a comment. Uh, Sir Yai Kusuma, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, hi, my name is Yai Kusuma. I'm from IPB University. Uh, hello everyone, <clears throat> uh, it is a pleasure to meet you. Uh, Takahashi Sensei, apa kabar? Yes, uh, <clears throat> as all you know that uh, we have a national language, which is uh, Bahasa Indonesia, and we don't actually have a second language, but we do have hundreds of uh, local language and but fortunately for our college students, uh, most of our students, uh, at least they have a, a, a sufficient uh, passive English. So uh, almost all of, of our textbooks are imported. So all of them are in English. And we also use uh, online uh, library. We subscribe to Science Direct, so all of our uh, readings material mostly in English, but fortunately, fortunately uh, at least most of our students have uh, sufficient uh, passive English so they can read uh, well, but when they speak, some are, uh, they have a very good English, but some are not so good, but it's okay. But as I'm gonna talk uh, later this afternoon, we're gonna share our experience and uh, uh, well, share our difficulties uh, during this uh, pandemic era. So uh, especially 
connection, internet connection. So that's uh, that's why uh, the uh, title of uh, our talk is about maintaining connection, not only the language but mostly uh, the internet connection. So uh, I think that's uh, our situation here in IPB in Bogor or maybe most of the uh, university in Indonesia. Uh, I think that's it. Thank you Thank very you. much, yeah. uh, Sir Yayi Kusuma. Uh, with all of those uh, sharings, I believe that for the Filipinos, it is high time for us to make our language, uh, the language of science, education, and research. Sir JC, may I just address a direct message uh, sent to me by Dr. I think uh, Dr. Javier? Oh, sure, um, Ahead, uh, she says that I might need to uh, define Tagalog versus Filipino for the audience, especially for the foreign uh, participants, and maybe also for the uh, Filipino participants, because a lot are con still confused on the concepts of our uh, uh, national language. So in brief, this is very difficult for me to, <laughs> to explain in brief. No? We have Tagalog, which is the basis of our national language way back in 1937. So as I said earlier, we have more than 100, 113 native languages in the Philippines. And uh, during that time, 1937, we are uh, at the brink of uh, independence from, from the US. So that, that was the Commonwealth era. And one of the advocacies of our then president, Manuel Quezon, is to push for a national language as a symbolic, uh, symbolical move for the independence of the Philippines and also for the education of the Philippines. And for Tomasians, we must be proud because the first university that uh, taught Philip uh, Tagalog, national, uh, the name of the course is National Language or Bansa, was the University of Santo Tomas in 1938. Uh, the, proof is that, the proof is that... Uh, the national, um, the national mandate to teach uh, the subject for the national language was only started during 1940. So anyways, Tagalog was, of course, uh, the language of the Tagalog region in Luzon, one of our major island, islands. Now, Filipino and Filipino, the uh, names of our national language was, was changed into Filipino in 1959 with a P and the spelling, and then Filipino currently since 1987, these concepts of national language are um, moves, moves for Filipino, for, for the national language to be a uh, multilingual based uh, national language, not only uh, using Tagalog. So most of our, um, most of our counterparts uh, in other professions or in, that, that do not belong to the Philippine departments are still confused. They, they, they think that uh, Filipino is still uh, Tagalog. The first proof is our modern alphabet. So our alphabet is not Abakada anymore. We have F, J, V, Z. You know, we have the eight uh, additional uh, letters that represent the sounds, not only of English and Spanish, the most influential foreign languages uh, in our history, but also of our native languages like Ifugao. We have the F. We have the Z from uh, Ibanag and all of across the Philippines. So the primary concept of Filipino the current national language is for it to develop and evolve not only from Tagalog, but all existing languages in the Philippines, both foreign and uh, local languages. So we have not only English, Spanish, we also have Arabic, Chinese, Japanese, and I think now we have Korean. So all this, uh, because we, we, we are uh, recognizing the dynamism of language and language is a living material of our culture and the expression of our uh, life as a society. So uh, all of these things are uh, our hope for our national language currently. Thank you very much, Dr. Fahidan, for that uh, very beautiful concluding uh, statement for this session on linguistic research. And with that, dear colleagues, uh, this is the end of our morning session of the day one of the fourth UST USP joint symposium. To end the morning session, may we ask everyone to please turn on their cameras.
Thank you very much. And after, let's all show our gratitude by giving a warm round of applause for all of our speakers this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you. To continue so, our... Will I do a uh, screenshot, JC? Oh, sure. Okay, so uh, just another screenshot for this session. So uh, please, uh, I hope everyone turns on their uh, cameras so that uh, we can have a photo in a way. <laughs> okay. So uh, here we go. So uh, wait, let's see. Let's wait for, ah, uh, there, there. Okay. People are still turning on their cameras. Okay, I think that's it. So uh, let's smile. Our biggest smile. One, two, three. Say cheese. Cheese. Okay. So uh, wait. Uh, I just need to save the file, and I'll take another one. One more. Uh, you can do your signature poses or whatever. Okay. So three, two, one. Smile. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dino. Now. Uh, for our afternoon session, uh, please make sure to be in the session hall uh, by 1 p.m. Philippine time. However, uh, we would encourage that you go to the session room, this same Zoom link, at least five to 10 minutes before the start of the session. So at least around 12.50 Philippine time. And with that, we'll see you again in two hours. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, thank you, and see you later.